Good evening. I'm Matt McLogan. On behalf of the Hollenstein Center for Presidential Studies at Grand Valley State University, welcome to this evening's debate between the Republican candidates for Congress in Michigan's 3rd District. This evening's program is being uh, sponsored by the Hollenstein Center, and the questions that will be posed to the candidates come from the audience, which has been invited by the Hollenstein Center to be with the candidates this evening. The third congressional district of Michigan consists of Kent, Ottawa, I'm sorry, Kent, Ionia, and Barry counties, and it is now my privilege to introduce the candidates. First, Steve Heacock. <laughs> Next, Robert Overbeek. <laughs> Louise Johnson. And Bill Hardiman. <laughs> the rules for this evening's debate are that the candidates may proceed with an opening statement the questions will then be posed. They have one minute to respond. Candidates who wish to take exception to that with a rebuttal will have three opportunities during the evening in order to express their contrary views. We'll now begin with the opening statement. The candidates drew straws before the program began, and we will begin with Steve Heacock. Mr. Heacock, please tell us why you are running for Congress and how you differ from the other candidates who join you this evening. Thanks, Matt. I greatly appreciate it. And frankly, this is the longest, longest job interview I've ever had. Uh, and and it, very much, it, it is very much that, and a very important job that needs to be done in Washington. And so what are the issues, and how can I deal with those issues? The first issue is jobs and the economy. And so what's on my resume? I just left a role where I had 2,000 jobs at phase two of the Van Andel Institute go through there. I've helped create jobs by helping put the arena in downtown helping with the Convention Center, helping with the Michigan State University College of Human Medicine and the wonderful Secchia Center that students are now in. Uh, those things I help create, they will help create an economy that's strong in the future. Taxes, that's also important. I was a tax accountant, CPA at Price Waterhouse, went on to practice tax law at Warner Norcross and Judd. How about health care? That's important as well. That battle is not done, it's just beginning. And so what was my role? I was a health lawyer at Warner North Cross, went on and became an executive at Priority Health and brought Medicaid in from the government to the private sector so we could administer that program there. Uh, had involvement at the Van Andel Institute as its chief administrative officer. What does that mean? It meant I, it meant I saw science uh, close up and saw what could be done to the future of health care and how in fact it'll be more efficient as we move into the future. Those issues are keenly important and it just so happens that my resume dovetails. And it's why I'm asking you to hire me. Hire me for this job, this very important job. It's also about the values we take to Washington, D.C. It's about taking the West Michigan way to Washington, D.C. rather than the other way around. It's about valuing family and having those values in what we believe in and taking them strongly there. It's also about getting things done. It's about results. And the reality is my, my background, my resume speaks of results. It's getting things done. It's not just talking about them, but getting to the end goal. Thank you. Mr. Overbeek. I'm Bob Overbeek, and I'm not for sale. I was born in Grand Rapids and raised in the working class suburb of Wyoming, where I live with my wife, Susie, and our four children. After graduating college, I served as a teacher until leaving Michigan to serve our country in the Air Force shortly after 9-11. In the military, I served as a nuclear physicist, and I fought in Afghanistan. War changes a person. Standing on the battlefield in Afghanistan, I realized we've lost our way, and our nation is in serious trouble from within. In this troubled economy, I felt compelled to come home and run for office. I've come to believe China, Russia, and Al-Qaeda <clears throat> are not our biggest threats, even though they may hurt us again. Our nation's biggest threat is from within. It is from large corporations that have used their big money to hijack our system of government. The root cause of this problem can be seen right here in West Michigan. The fact that corporations spend millions locally for good works and pretty buildings while they rake in billions from China and other places 
does not give them the right to destroy America's middle class for their gain. Don't be fooled. Amway wants their own congressman and will stop at no cost to satisfy that goal. With the Van Andels behind Mr. Heacock and the DeVosses behind Mr. Amash, we see government of the money, by the money, and for the rich at its worst. And sadly, this pattern repeats itself in districts all over our country. Well, neighbors, have you had enough yet? My candidacy for your congressional seat provides a clear choice for the first time in 16 years. In this campaign, I've personally knocked over 10,000 doors and met over 60,000 people. I haven't met you yet, but chances are I've met your neighbors or coworkers. Ask them about meeting Bob Overby. I'm not chasing the big money at your expense. When I say I'm not for sale, you can Sorry. count on it. I am Bob Overbeek, and hire me to serve as your congressman is the next best thing to you being there yourself. Thank you. Ms. Johnson. Thank you. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Louise Johnson, uh, known to uh, many as Ellie, which uh, for all of you, my first and middle initials are L-E. That's how you get the L-E. I've got a law practice right across the, uh, the river here. I've been there for a little under 12 years. I love lawyering absolutely love it. I would do it for free. I'm glad they pay me. I've never thrown my hat into a political arena before, but the state of our great country is the reason I'm here. A little about me. I was uh, born in South Carolina and uh, I think before I was one year old, moved back to my father's home uh, who was in the military, in the Navy for six years, and retired after 30 years at White's Product. But a little city called uh, Middleville, just down the, the way here, 25 miles, 30 miles. And every single day, and as a little kid, you just think your parents tell you something. Every single day, my parents would tell myself and my other four brothers and sisters, honey, you don't need anyone, and you can be anything you want and do anything you want in this great country. And they were so right. But that, that truth that our entire country is founded on, our Constitution is founded on, why we settled here is being threatened. And I can't stand back and let it happen any longer. So I'm removing myself from my law practice. If you folks will have me as your third congressional district congresswoman, I'm going to hang up what I would like to do, what I love to do, and take on a task that often many have said, why do you want to do that? It needs to be done, and I'm the one for this job. With me, you will get transparency. As a matter of folks, as a matter of fact, folks, in this position that I've not been elected to, I've been asked to remove myself, use my political clout, throw it into another individual's arena. In exchange, I'll get a U.S. attorney position. I'm not for sale. My special interest Time. is the people of this district and the citizens of the United States. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Hardiman. Thank you very much. Good evening. I'm very pleased to be here, and thank you, Grand Valley, for holding this uh, debate. My name is Bill Hardiman. I'm running for Congress. We live in a very critical time in the history of the United States with high unemployment, economic downturn, uh, massive bailouts, huge government takeovers like the health care bill. We need change. It was another critical time in the history of this country. And at that time, I stepped forward and served in the United States Army. And I went to Vietnam. Now, anyone serving in the Army, whether drafted or enlisting, it's as though you sign a promissory note that's redeemable up to your life. And so you invest. And I invested that part of my life into this country. There's an old saying, where your treasures, there where your heart be also. I love this country more when I came back than I did when I went over. We're still serving at a critical time. And I'm still a soldier. And so to combat the things that are going on, I've gained some experience over the years. As mayor of Kentwood, uh, we balanced a budget every year. We maintained a AA bond rating. We uh, kept some fund balances so we didn't live on the edge. We even implemented a defined contribution for the long-term sustainability of that city. We've also worked at the state level. 
And I believe that right now we need someone who's tested and trusted and effective in Washington, D.C. to represent this community. You have five wonderful people, uh, four wonderful people, excuse me, one is not here. You have four wonderful people standing here before you. I ask you to consider me because of the fact that I am tested, I believe I'm trusted, and I can be very effective in making a difference for our country and for this community in Washington, D.C. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Hardiman. We'll move now to questions, and uh, before doing that, let me make sure that everyone understands that there are five candidates for Congress on the Republican ticket. State Representative Justin Amash was invited to attend this evening, and he declined the invitation. First question is for Senator Hardiman. The war in Afghanistan is not going well. How would you encourage Congress to act? What would you do as a member of Congress with regard to a position on the Afghan war? And would you also address the leak of secret material, which has been in the news this week? Well, it's, it's horrible to have uh, secret material leaked, and that's not a good thing. And I think we need to pursue and, and uh, uh, bring to justice anyone who, who does leak the material. But the fact is, is that the war, um, I think, is a war that we have to win. Uh, there are terrorists that are threatening this country and many other countries. Uh, and it, it has to be run by the generals who are involved. They've given uh, requests to President Obama. After some time, President Obama uh, granted the request to uh, give more troops, but also sent drones there, which will help save lives. I think we have to set a, a right kind of plan to pursue the war, and I think Congress needs to support uh, those efforts, but also support our fighting men and women with the right kind of equipment uh, and, and enough funding so that we can pursue this war and win it and move out. Work with the Afghan people to establish democracy there, but we must win it, move out, and we cannot, we cannot uh, allow ourselves to set a deadline for when it should end, because if we do that, that gives the enemy too much uh, uh, information. Thank you. Uh, next question is for Mr. Heacock. Uh, what ideas do you have to decrease government intervention in business? You know, the reality is that we're on the wrong track, and government, uh, with the health program in particular, but, but also with uh, much of what we've seen in, in the overhaul bill and what's going on, is far too involved in our daily lives, and the marketplace cannot work. Let me give you an example in healthcare. Uh, Medicare and Medicaid uh, now amount to over 50%, really 62% or so, of the revenues for most hospitals in Michigan. That means we don't have a private marketplace. We don't have any competition that's created by that. So what would I do to resolve it? Uh, the reality is we have to quit relying on government for all of our needs, and we have to decide, in fact, to change our attitude. Uh, things from the government are not free. There is a taxpayer on the other uh, end of the formula, and we need to recognize that and move quickly and, and as, as uh, abruptly as we can to a better, freer marketplace. Thank you. Uh, the next question is for Mr. Overbeek. I'm a young voter. <coughs> this is not me. The, the, I'm, I'm, I'm a young voter, and I wonder what your plan is for reaching out to the younger generation and to get us more involved in political life. Well, I've done so in my campaign. I've had the opportunity to knock over 10,000 doors and shake over 60,000 hands. And I've had the honor of doing that uh, with our senior citizens, uh, those who have gone before us with experience, all the way down to our young children uh, whose futures are getting mortgaged at the expense of big money in politics that's hijacked our system of government and brought the results that we have. The reality is here in West Michigan that while we have big buildings and while we have uh, these results, you drive down 28th Street and practically every other business is, uh, is closed or shut down. What kind of economic opportunities are those when we have uh, our sons and daughters, our children and grandchildren seeking opportunities elsewhere. Because I'm not beholden to anyone but you, to anyone but the young, our children and grandchildren, veterans, senior citizens, working class and small business, uh, and only accepting a buck per individual in my run for Congress, that's how I'm going to reach out to everyone and represent everyone equally. Thank you. Um, Ms. Johnson, what role should privatization play in reducing government spending and in managing the affairs of government? What role should privatization, privatization 
Wow. What a great question. Thank you for asking. Uh, as big of a role as possible. I've been advocating since I threw my hat into this arena that we need to instill in the folks that are passing the laws, making the laws that will funnel down this huge mountain and wind up in our backyards, in our living rooms, we need to make them feel what it is they're legislating and sending down that pipeline. And the less we have them dictating what comes down that pipeline in the form of privatization as much as we possibly can, the less waste, the less huge government spending, the less um, unaccountability, the less pork that goes on, the less backroom dealings that will occur. And let me get one thing straight. I understand, as you understand, big business and small business and individuals at times cannot be trusted. But by the same token, big business, big corporations and little corporations are gracious people who volunteer their time, their efforts and their money. They're not terribly bad people. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Heacock has asked for a rebuttal. Yeah, two, two examples. Uh, one, one is health care, and, and you look at the Canadian system that many seem to, to want to move toward, and in fact, they're moving away from it, privatizing more and more services because it provides good quality at the right price. Second is education. Look at the entrepreneurial education and what charter schools have done, not just in this state but elsewhere. It creates competition and the ability for folks to work within that system without the burden, frankly, of the unions and others interfering with their job uh, relationship with their boss. Uh, rebuttal, Mr. Hardiman. Yes, I would just say this. I think that uh, uh, if you can't find it uh, in the yellow pages, then government should probably do it. Anything else should be open for government to do. And when I, we talk about private, privatization, we've worked to do that, even at the state level, where human services were, are being provided by the state. Uh, we have moved very strongly to uh, move those contracts to private community-based organizations where the price is better, there's a, more of a mission focus. And so there are many areas that we can privatize uh, and I believe save money. So privatization plays a great role. Mr. Overbeek? Yeah, well, what is it fair for the American worker? Are we competitive globally? When it comes to privatized business, uh, we are losing to other nations. In fact, the big money behind Mr. Heacock uh, in, in Amway, they, they conduct their operations overseas, 80% or more. Uh, is, that, is that really fair? We need fair trade. We, the, our jobs are moving overseas, and we are not competitive in the private marketplace. Not just free trade, but fair trade for America. Thank you. Next question is for Mr. Hardiman. Uh, if you had been a member of Congress uh, the year before and last year, you would have faced voting on uh, the Troubled Asset Relief Program, TARP, and the auto bailout. If you had been in Congress, how would you have addressed both of those issues? I would have voted no. Now, it's, it's easier to look back at... No on, both. no on both. It's easy to look back at issues, but even during the time, I wondered, well, what if uh, GM filed bankruptcy? It doesn't mean that the company uh, obviously goes away. It means that they have a chance to uh, reorganize and perhaps uh, get out from under some of the, the debt that they have and proceed forward. So I, I think uh, what's uh, costing us so much is some of these massive bailouts I think we have to stop that, and we ha have to stop the overspending. I think that's absolutely critical. Thank you. Uh, next question is for Ms. Johnson. The uh, Congress this year addressed a bill uh, which has been called cap and trade, which would reduce CO2 emissions from power plants and uh, other large industries. If you'd been serving in Congress, would you have voted for or against that proposal? And in general, what are your views on alternative energy? Well, I would have voted against that proposal um, for the same reason that I asked in the, answered in the previous question. Less government is best government. And if the marketplace can uh, regulate through competition, through competition by ideas from innovative R&D and uh, at competing companies to make those emissions as little as possible, I think is the best approach. You cut out the government fat and there is absolutely to be benefits from that. We need to compensate individuals who do that research and development and can limit those emissions, not from a mandated from government, uh, big fat government, but from good old fashioned uh, competition and the free market. Thank you. 
Thank you. Uh, Senator Hardiman? Thank you. Cap and trade is, is uh, it's just a horrible idea. Uh, yes, we need to uh, uh, be good stewards over our environment. But this is a, a tax, a carbon tax, and it's plain and simple. It doesn't really reduce uh, the carbon emissions. It's been estimated that uh, uh, it would uh, equal $646 billion in new taxes on coal, oil, natural gas, which provides 85% of our energy. We don't need a tax on energy. We need to be energy independent. That's what we need to work for. Thank you. Next question is for Mr. Heacock. What criteria would you use to determine which green energy sources the government should support? The, the green energy sources that make sense and are viable will stand up uh, on their own in the marketplace. And for example, wind right now is about 30% more expensive than coal produced energy. Um, that is flattening out as, as, the, uh, as frankly, the, the technology improves. It's much better than it was 10 years ago. It'll be much better 10 years from now. So our goal is to keep the window open in the use of fossil fuels and to use those carefully through conservation and other means so that we can develop the technology necessary to make the alternatives uh, viable. You know, at the Van Andel Institute, for example, we put solar panels on the top of the building, uh, and, and it's tough to make that pay back. Now, was it a good move? Sure, because we do gather some peak energy at the peak time. So when it's sunniest and hottest, uh, we're ga uh, capturing some energy for that, for that use and avoiding then the use of coal-produced energy. So it can be done, but, but it's, but it's going to take some time. We need a gap of time to create the innovations we need. Mr. Overbeek, a rebuttal? Yes, we need to move more towards nuclear energy in America. I'm a nuclear physicist. The reality is that only a little bit of a nuclear power plant is actually nuclear. The rest of it is mechanical, industrial, and hardworking Americans can help uh, build those uh, nuclear power plants. We need incentives for companies who choose to do so. We need to streamline the bureaucratic process. And in doing so, we, we will have a strong and vibrant America moving forward where we will be able to create those jobs and sustain our future. Uh, the next question is for you, uh, Mr. Overbeek. Uh, would you please give examples of, of how you would cooperate in Washington with members of the opposing party and cite a couple of examples of subjects that you believe uh, that kind of cooperation could, uh, could be achieved? I will cooperate with those in Washington because I'm seeking to represent not only our people equally, but to do the right thing for America. Legislation is not a Republican piece of legislation a democratic piece of legislation. And in fact, the recent health care bill shows that every single Republican voted against it, every single Democrat voted for it. Look at the uh, bailouts. 25 Republicans voted for the bailouts. Only two Republicans voted for extending unemployment. My ideas for working with the other side of the aisle, well, I actually created a PAC for America, political act for America. You can go on my website, boboverbeek.com. Or actually, you can give me a call about it, and I'd be happy to discuss it with any, anyone. My number is 616-916-6819. It has a balanced budget amendment to the U.S. Constitution, earmarked Prohibition Act, American Fair Trade Act, to equalize the playing field for uh, our hardworking men and women in small businesses, fair taxes, federal education reform. Those are American issues. Already, eight Republican candidates for Congress two Democratic candidates for Congress, an independent, and three libertarians have come and joined my PAC. That's how I'm going to lead and work together in Washington. Thank you. The next question is for Mr. Hardiman. Uh, are you in favor of extending uh, the uh, Bush era tax cuts, which are set to expire the, at the end of this year? Absolutely. And particularly, when I talk about capital gains, right now we're in a critical time in our economy. And there are many small businesses that need capital. So to extend that tax cut uh, means a lot. Uh, I read a report that said I think for every, I believe it's every dollar of the tax cut in capital gains produces uh, $10.61 in, uh, in gross domestic product. Uh, product. So uh, I am in favor of extending those tax cuts. I think it's a good idea. And we need to spur on our economy. That's the way we're going to uh, have more jobs. And the real issue in this state is jobs. Uh, I, I find that when I go out and talk with people uh, on the trail, uh, in church, uh, in the store. It's about jobs, so extending the tax cuts, I think, helps us to move forward in that, in, in that area. 
Thank you. The next question is for Ms. Johnson. What is the appropriate role of Congress in job creation uh, and the economy? Uh, get out of the way. You know, however many words that is. Get out of the way and let people, let industry, let individuals who have uh, contact with the pocket and their checkbook and their balance sheets figure out how to, one, <clears throat> maximize all that we have in this country, and two, how to compete in this country with our expansive, uh, re our expansive lessening on, on trade, <clears throat> how to compete simply with individuals who are only requiring 80 cents, 90 cents, or a dollar to do what we do in this country because we have all of these great benefits and all the, the rights and the wonderful roads and everything, how we compete with this country that takes about 15 or 20 dollars to compete. So simply put, get the heck out of the way and let the American population, the American public, the backbone of this country fix what Congress has got us into. Thank you. Mr. Heacock, a rebuttal? Yes, please. Thank you, Matt. Um, in, in, in the local community, it's the private-public partnerships, frankly, that have created the, created the pretty buildings that are full of lots of people working and attracting other people to jobs here in this community. It's that quality of life that's really important. And frankly, I'm thankful for the families that have supported that and all the people here have put their money forward to make that happen uh, because it's important to the, to the economic vitality of this community. We're a community that's vibrant where people want to live and want to invest uh, in part because of those partnerships. Mr. Overbeek, you have now, you, if you do this, you've used all your rebuttals. I, I just want to make sure you know that. Uh, reality is, public-private partnerships, this is, what, this is what the reality is. Amway tax break over 10 years ago, worth $283 million, went to one corporation. That was Amway. And that's the reality in America. With the average Wall Street bonus for 2009, we're up 17% when compared to 2008. That's the public-private partnerships that we have in America because the big money and their candidates, such as Mr. Heacock, Mr. Amash, uh, have the big money has hijacked their system of government. And if that's the result you want, uh, send them to Washington. Thank you. Uh, next question is for Mr. Hardiman. Um, a significant part of the social services budget involves uh, Medicare and Medicaid, which are partnerships with the state and federal governments. What is your view of the, the functionality of that partnership? And as a member of Congress, what, if anything, would you seek to change? Well, uh, there are a lot of things to, to, to work on with those issues. Um, first of all, I think that we could probably save some money uh, if we send the federal dollars down to the state, but do it more in block grant form so that we can have some flexibility in how we utilize it. I think in, 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 in doing that, uh, it's going to be more effective. Uh, we've done that in the Department of Human Services. And I think we can do that there. There's, there's another huge issue with Medicaid and Medicare and some of the other uh, uh, entitlements. Uh, it's a huge part of the federal budget. And if we're actually going to cut the federal budget, we have to look at those. Uh, that doesn't mean that we uh, eliminate them or leave people high and dry. I believe we need to keep our, our promises to our senior citizens, those who are retired and those who are near retirement, but we need to look at more private market reforms for those who are much younger so that we won't be running into the debt that we're going to run into in, in those entitlements. Okay. Rebuttal, and, and just let me say to all the candidates, rebuttals are really intended to rebut a previous point, not just an opportunity to add on to a statement. I, I understand, thank you very much. Um, with respect to the Medicaid and Medicare and, and, the, uh, and the Social Security, uh, of course it's necessary, but this is what I'd like to say. The federal government has to quit borrowing writing IOUs to the Social Security Administration. Everyone's talking about it's broke, it's going broke. But in part because Americans are living longer, which is a wonderful thing, but by the way, we used to be the 11th uh, longest living uh, citizenry in the world. We're now the 40th because we have an unhealthy uh, populace. But the rest of our governments who can't balance, the, the rest of our government agencies who can't right. balance their budgets are robbing the Social Security system. We need to cut that out, thank you. Uh, the next question is, is for Mr. Heacock, and it involves Social Security and entitlements, which now constitute 40% uh, of the federal budget. Is that sustainable? 
and if not, what would you specifically propose to change? It's not sustainable. In fact, a $13 trillion deficit we now have will double in the next 10 years, primarily because of those entitlements. Uh, and we do need to do something. And we, we've got to quit uh, worrying about re-elections and things and actually get to the nature of the problem. Uh, if you look at people on Social Security, for example, for those people over 65, 60% 60 of their incomes come from Social Security. If you look for the poorest, 40%, 80% of their incomes from, come from Social Security. So we cannot stop the benefits for the people currently in that program. We can't pull the rug from under them. We're a compassionate society that cares that those people have money to eat and to live. Uh, so the question becomes really, what do we do for future generations? And I believe strongly that we ought to allow younger people the chance to invest outside of the system, that we ought to give them credit for investing in 401ks, KEOs, and IRAs, and in fact, allow them to do that in lieu of contributions to Social Security. We're at a 3.1 to 1 ratio today. In 10 years, it'll be 2 to 1, and it's not enough to sustain the program. So we've got to get to the answer uh, today. Thank you. Ms. Johnson. Uh, very briefly, we are on notice, folks, that uh, the government running our, our uh, retirement has come to an end for a lot of reasons. And so all of us are on notice. We need to be seeking alternative means of taking care of ourselves not the government. We step back from the government entitlement table, whether you paid into it or not, and start investing in those privatized business entities that you man yourself. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, keeping track for the benefit of the candidates, uh, each of you has one rebuttal remaining except for Mr. Overbeek, who has consumed all of his, and you get the next question. Uh, unemployment in Michigan continues at uh, high levels. It's the second highest in the United States. What's the appropriate role of the federal government in addressing unemployment? And as a member of Congress, would you have voted for the extension of benefits that was stalled in D.C. last week? The appropriate action of the federal government is to pass uh, fair trade. We have free trade in America, but our jobs are going overseas to China and other nations. Those same nations <clears throat> subsidize the cost of raw materials at the expense of hardworking Americans and small businesses. Fair trade imposes tariffs on those nations. We need to commit ourselves as a country, and right here in West Michigan, to produce, to buy local, and then to export the excess. The men and women of the 3rd District have paid for the massive exportation of jobs, and we need to fix that. That's what I'm going to fight for in Congress as West Michigan's next congressman. Mr. Hardiman, the next question is for you. What should the nation's immigration policy be? And specifically, uh, what do you do about uh, undocumented or illegal aliens living here now? Well, uh, first of all, uh, I think we need to, uh, to look at how we handle the visas. Uh, there are H-1 visas for unskilled labor that come in. And uh, certainly, if these jobs can be done by citizens, uh, they're available, and they should be. But many times, uh, they aren't. And so uh, there are those in the various industries, such as agriculture, uh, that need additional workers. And so I think we need to set our visas based on, at least partially, on what business needs are. And so we uh, have very unskilled. We have skilled. Uh, I think that's the H-2 level and O for uh, highly skilled uh, uh, folks. So we need to look at those visas. We need to streamline the visa process. Um, and uh, we need to make it easier for uh, those who should come in to come in. Uh, as it relates to uh, our, our policy, I think we need to secure our borders. If a country like America cannot secure its borders, we're in deep, deep trouble. Uh, we need to secure our borders to stop uh, illegal aliens from coming in. I know my time is up. Ms. Johnson. Uh, simply put, we need to enforce our current laws that we have with respect to individuals that are entering our country illegally. Just as it is illegal to drive drunk, whether you are a resident of this country or Michigan or not, it is illegal to come here unless you have proper authorization. Institute those actions that curb that, whether you tighten up the border, the individuals that are found to be here illegally, that I have come between before my law practice often, who wind up in the Kent County Jail for 90 days on a drunk driving, and the INS is Time. contacted, the INS has to come and pick them up and ship them back. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Heacock, 
Uh, transportation funding has been an issue in Michigan for years, which sends more money to Washington than it gets back for roads. What would you do specifically as a member of Congress to change that? Well, the, you know, the, the system was set up so that the, uh, the, the gasoline tax, federal gasoline tax, would cover those, those roads. And, and much, much as is true with other programs, it's been borrowed and used for other things. So first of all, the allocation has to be pure, and we have to take those funds that are designated for that use and use it uh, for that purpose. Um, secondly, infrastructure is in need of repair. And, and it's not just roads, it's bridges, it's throughout our country. Uh, infrastructure is incredibly important. It has been that ability to do interstate commerce has been a part of our founding principle and part of what we began with. And we need to make certain that we, we do put the uh, measures in place so that we can take care of those roads and bridges that need repair. Uh, the, the problem, of course, is priority. And where does it fit? Uh, because the truth is we have a great deficit. Our tax system is, is uncertain and too high. It's the second highest in the industrialized uh, world, and so we lose jobs because of it. So it is difficult to find, uh, Matt, but I believe we need to prioritize that and make it a program we push forward. Mr. Overbeek, uh, if you're elected to Congress, one, one matter you're going to have to deal with fairly soon is the future of uh, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. What is the continued appropriate role of the federal government in uh, home ownership and the and, uh, mortgage business? Well, what's happening in Washington right now with the big money that's hijacked our system of government, these laws that are passed, this financial reform bill, doesn't go far enough. When it comes to these big banks, we need to break up the big banks. We need to pass the same antitrust laws that was passed in 1933 after the uh, Great Depression, that Banking Act of 1933 the four largest banks in America. We're to the point where the FDIC can no longer insure those deposits. Uh, they are way too large. The result of this is that the middle class, in, in these pieces of legislation, the middle class has eroded. Now, you know, Mr. Heacock, he sits on bank boards, and he has, a, he has strong ties to banking. You know, your mentor is uh, Congressman Ehlers. He voted for the Wall Street bailout, the largest legal theft of taxpayer money in our history. Yes or no? Would you have voted for the bailout if you're, if you're elected to Congress? I think you're out of time. I'd love to rebut. Uh, <laughs> First of all, the question was Fannie and Freddie, and obviously Mr. Overbeek has avoided it because he doesn't, uh, doesn't understand the question or, or have an answer for it. Uh, they cover 70% of the mortgages in the country. We've, we've now incurred $125 billion of bailouts for them. They should have been included in the overhaul, and it's a necessary part of that regulation. Uh, it, as far as what big banks do, there, there certainly is too much attention to the big banks, not enough to the Main Street banks, uh, for example, like those I've served on the boards on that actually fund the working capital for job-producing small business here in West Michigan. Thank you. Ms. John. Uh, no, your rebuttals are up. I'm sorry. Oh, am I? Okay. Yep. Uh, but you do get the next question. Oh, so, cool. Thanks. Uh, the, United, uh, the defense budget of the United States equals that of the total of the next 20 largest nations that okay. have defense budgets. Is that the right ratio for the United States? Is that the right ratio? Um, it may very well be. It may very well be. Uh, the reason I can't say absolutely yes or absolutely no is because I don't have all the internal data. Uh, but I can tell you this, we have to secure our borders here. What happened in New York and 9-11 should never, ever happen again. And honestly, if it's the 20th largest or the 50th largest, if it takes that much to make sure we never have what happened in this country in 9-11, I'd say oh, I'm all for it. Increase my taxes. Thank you. Mr. Hardiman, next question. What is the most important environmental matter that the United States faces, and what as a member of Congress uh, would you do about it? Boy, there are a few that I could think of. Uh, um, I think I, I would call this an environmental matter, uh, energy. And uh, we have an environmental situation right now in the Gulf where uh, we have a horrible, horrible oil spill. But I do believe that we cannot uh, stop seeking to be energy independent. 
Now, I, I think that means a lot of things. I think that means taking a look at how we regulate that. I think there was, there our oversight was lax on, on that. BP has uh, a lot of uh, uh, exceptions and problems in their history. And so we should have been on top of that even before uh, this, uh, this problem came up. Also, I think it means uh, where we drill and how we drill. I do believe that we need to drill, but sometimes there's slant drilling versus um, drilling uh, from the water as, as they're doing there. Uh, but I think we also need to go to, to look at uh, nuclear energy. Uh, conservation is another one. A variety of kinds of energy so that we will become, uh, be energy independent. And I think that's also a conservation issue as well. Thank you. Mr. Overbeek, um, more than 40% of the people who live in the 3rd Congressional District are Democrats. How will you represent them? Well, because I'm only accepting $1 per individual and giving everything above that to charity in the 3rd Congressional District right here, I will be beholden to everyone equally. The big, not, big money is not going to hijack Bob Overbeek because he's not for sale. And so when it comes to serving our people, the legislation, as I mentioned, it's not Republican, it's not Democrat. What's the right thing to do? That's how I will represent <clears throat> Democrats, Republicans, independent Americans in the 3rd Congressional District as their next congressman. The next question is for Mr. Heacock. The uh, health care program adopted by Congress and signed by the President this year, in your view, is uh, proper, legal, sustainable, or should be changed? Um, I think it should be changed, and I, I don't think it is sustainable. And it's because of something called adverse selection. Uh, basically, the way the bill is designed, there's a three-to-one limit on how much the, the premiums can change, which means younger people are going to be subsidizing older people, which means they're going to opt out of the plan. And first, they have to be audited and caught. And secondly, if they are, they can pay a penalty and avoid it. But they can sign up as soon as they're sick. So instead of having pools full of young, healthy people, you're going to have sick people covered only. And that's the costs are much greater than indicated. Um, secondly, corporations, for example, if you insure 100 people in your business, it costs you about a million dollars, and that's a little light. It's probably a million three, a million two today. But the reality is you can pay $200,000 in penalties instead, so you're going to opt out of the program. That, again, hasn't been taken care of in the program. And I, I, if I were more cynical than I am, I might think they did it on purpose so that they can move then to a public plan next. I do not view it as sustainable. I think we need to get to a strong, robust individual market that pays on quality outcomes rather than procedures. Ms. Johnson, what is the very first thing you would do as a member of Congress on January 3rd, 2011? Take away all the chairs in uh, the Congress. Make everybody have to stand up and talk to each other and not get real comfortable. Um, I say that kind of tongue-in-cheek, but there might be something to that. Uh, well, that's the first thing I'd do. Do you want the second thing I would do? Sure. Okay. The second thing I would do is make those individuals in Congress have to feel what we've been feeling all along. If this health care bill is such a great idea, let's take their wonderful health care that they've entitled themselves, as well as their pension, and let's remove that, think of the money we could save on that, and have them grovel on down here. So those would be two things. Maybe a 20% pay cut for the con uh, congressional individuals as well would maybe the third thing. I know I'm beyond the question, um, but I still have 15 seconds to go. Uh, but the other thing is, as far as a 20% pay cut, that's a drop in the bucket compared to what many Americans have felt, 20, 30. How about no job? Thank you. Mr. Hardiman, if you were a member of Congress and King for a day, what federal program would you terminate? Hmm. Uh, what federal program would I terminate? I would terminate... Well, you stumped me there. I didn't expect that one. Uh, what federal program would I terminate? Um, what, what program I would, do you think might have outlived its usefulness? Well, here's, here's what I'd terminate. Uh, I don't know if this is what you're referring to, but I would terminate uh, the, the health care bill that was just passed. I think it's an awful bill. Uh, it's not that the, the, the purpose is awful. Uh, the purpose is right. But the bill is awful because it's going to uh, increase higher premiums, raise taxes, uh, but I would implement some uh, private market solutions to that, like uh, tort reform, uh, portability, 
the ability to buy uh, insurance across state lines, um, uh, pooling, those kinds of things that make sense that would actually help to lower the cost of health care instead of implementing such an onerous uh, uh, bill. It's really a, a takeover, a part of our, our economy, and uh, there's so much bureaucracy involved in it, it's going to help bind uh, up businesses to, and some may even fail because of it. So I would terminate that. Okay. Next question, Mr. Overbeek. Uh, the president was in West Michigan um, recently and uh, dedicated a plant that's going to be <coughs> making uh, batteries for the auto industry for electric cars. Is that the sort of activity in which the federal government ought to be engaged? I think the federal government ought to uh, incentivize the auto industry to move in the direction of electric cars, to build these batteries, to set up uh, electric charging stations all across America. We have to become less dependent upon foreign oil in the United States of America and start ensuring a strong and vibrant America moving forward. Most certainly, the federal government should provide incentives so that uh, the auto companies can move in this direction and we can get our, our hardworking men and women and small businesses back to work. Mr. Heacock, um, Michigan and surrounding Great Lakes states uh, are <coughs> grappling with the issue of Asian carp. If you were in Congress right now, what would you be encouraging the Congress and the administration to do? First of all, it's, a, it's an incredibly uh, important problem. And it's not just Asian carp, it's, also, it's all the invasive species. And I, I am lucky enough to do some scuba diving. If you go to the bottom of Lake Michigan or Lake Huron, it's a desert there. And all you see are the gobies that are invasive species and then the mussels that are covering the ships, uh, the old 18, uh, 1800 schooners. Um, and, and you don't see the schools of whitefish you used to. You don't see schools of lake trout uh, that ought to be there. Uh, we've got to stop the problem. It's not impossible. It's about ballast being dumped as, as ships enter the St. Lawrence Seaway. It can be done. There are electrical fences that can be built to kill the species that are on those, on those ships. It really is a matter of just putting in place those measures that can stop uh, what has become a tremendous problem. The Asian carp in particular, there's places on the Mississippi uh, River where they're 97 percent of the biomass. Uh, they eat 40 percent of their weight a day. Uh, so they will just decimate the Great Lakes as soon as they get there and, and there's already evidence that they're there. So we've got to stop it. We've got to stop it today. Ms. Johnson, same question. Can you repeat the question, please? Um, if you, were in con if you were in Congress, how would you deal with the bill that has been introduced to try to uh, militate against the Asian carp getting into the Great Lakes? Well, this is what I would do. Um, as I understand the numbers, Michigan has about seven or eight times more to lose by leaving those locks open so that these not native species can infiltrate our Great Lakes and sabotage our fishing industry as well as all of the environmental problems. And so very much like our president put a six month instantaneous moratorium on drilling in the, uh, in the Gulf until we get it solved, let's instantly close these locks up, figure out how to have those fish quit coming in and causing the problems in Michigan's uh, area that's about, as I said, seven or eight times more impact in trillions of dollars than it will be our neighboring Illinois. Thank you. Senator Hardiman, last, this will be the last question of the night. Uh, you spoke earlier about drilling in the Gulf. Uh, would you allow drilling in the Great Lakes? Well, uh, that's prohibited even now by state law, and I think that's appropriate. Uh, so I have more time left. Can I go back to another question? You may. Thank you very much. So let me talk about transportation. Um, uh, transportation is a very critical issue, and I served on the Senate Appropriations Subcommittee for Transportation. And I would say that we need to get more of our transportation dollars back. It's, it's very important for, for uh, business, uh, for individuals, for everyone. So uh, here's what I, I think we have an opportunity. The chair uh, and, and the minority vice chair of the uh, Powerful Ways and Means Committee will, should be from Michigan. Uh, right now, we have uh, 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 Congressman Levin, I believe, Camp in, in position uh, for, the, for that position. So we have an opportunity. I think we need to change the formula. Uh, there are several things we need to do, we could do. One, we need to try to get as much money back as, as possible, but 
those Ten states, seconds. pardon? 10 seconds. Uh, who, who, can, who can block that will block that. So I think we need to look at block uh, grant funding, which would help us use it more economically. We need to look at floor funding, which I think will help to raise that floor so that we base our formula on that and we'll get more money back. It's critical that we get more money back for transportation. Candidates, the evening has gone quickly. The time for questions is over, and it's now <coughs> the opportunity for closing statements. Uh, those were also drawn by straw. Senator Hardiman, you get to go first. Thank you very much. Uh, a pleasure to be here and uh, a pleasure to respond to the questions. Uh, I, I found, found it uh, rather difficult to respond in a minute, so uh, please, if any of you would like to visit my uh, website, BillHardiman.com, uh, we have more uh, information on, on there. But we are discussing some very important issues. To me, the, the key issue is still jobs. Uh, I ran into a, a gentleman uh, on the Paul Henry Trail who uh, saw me and, and asked if he could stop and speak with me. And he, he did, so I stopped. And he said, uh, Senator Hardman, could you pray for me? Uh, I just was downsized. I lost my job after 26 out of 30 years, so that let me know he was four years away from retirement. And I've got two kids going to college, and we did. The issue is jobs. So I've been involved in the community, I'm meeting people, and I've got the uh, proven record to be effective at the state level, at the local level, and now in Congress to help make it happen. And I ask for your support. Thank you very much for allowing me to speak today. Thank you. Ms. Johnson. Thank you. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. And as I uh, indicated earlier, I'm not a politician. I've never thrown my hat into an arena before. But uh, let me tell you just real briefly, three and a half years ago, my son Tyson was killed in a freak motorcycle accident. And in the nanosecond, they came to my house at 1 a.m. and told me about what no parent wants to receive or experience, I had a choice. I had a choice to either decide this is a miserable life or you pick yourself up as much as you can and move on. And I'm here to tell you, as much as I live that, love that kid and miss that kid, we're moving on. I want to do that for the people of the 3rd the Congressional District as, as, far, as well as America. I only want to go there. I don't want to go there for an entire lifetime. I want to go there for four, maybe six years, maybe eight years if they're nice to me. <laughs> And, and do what I know works, and that is be independent, be responsible on yourself, and all of us take a huge giant, giant step away from relying on the government. That's not how this country was made. That's not how this country has thrived this long. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Overby. Have you had enough of the most elite in our society buying our government to serve their interests at your expense? Are you better off today than you were two or even four years ago? If you're happy with corporate America calling the shots in Washington, Vote for the Amway candidates, Mr. Heacock or Mr. Amash, who's not here. The Amway crowd has sold out us to the Chinese for profit, sending Mr. Heacock and Mr. Amash to Congress in Washington in the midst of this economic crisis is like rubbing poison ivy on a rash. There's no relief there. I'm sad to say that that's if what's good for Amway and the many large corporations is no longer good for West Michigan and our country. Neighbors, it's time we come together and figure out how to produce locally, buy locally, and export the excess. The power is in your hands. The power to change the channel when you see those empty TV ads. Beware, the only emptiness isn't in the com those commercials. You elect those politicians, and it will be your pockets they will empty with their policies that protect the big Chinese-loving corporations like Amway and Mr. Amash's tool import business. If you want more lawyers, send them to Congress. If not, hire Bob Overby, because I'm the next best thing to you being in Congress. And I'm not for sale. Thank you. Mr. Heacock. Thank you. First of all, I'd like to thank Bob for acknowledging that I'm the front runner in the race. Uh, it's greatly appreciated. <laughs> uh, and actually, I have great respect for everybody up here because they were willing to stand up and answer questions and face the public. Uh, there's a candidate not willing to do that, and you wonder how in the world do you expect to stand up in Washington, D.C. and get something done if you can't stand here in Grand Rapids. Uh, listen, I, you know, to me, this is about leadership, service, and results. And I offer you my resume and my background and my sincere belief in this community and the people of it. Uh, we, this is a great, great community, and we've done extraordinary things, and we can continue that path. We can be even better than we have been. The next 10 years, we're on the cusp of greatness, given the life sciences corridor and all that's coming, and it's just a matter of us drawing together and making it happen, and we need help in Washington, D.C. We need help in Lansing. We need everybody uh, pulling their oars so that the boat's all going in the same direction. 
I greatly appreciate your attention and greatly appreciate your being here tonight. Thank you. And candidates, thank you. <laughs>